in in terms of your your uh, professional work, I I, I mean I I've I, I, I've read um, almost all of your books, including um, uh, Words and Rules, and uh, um, uh, and I'm very interested um, in the types of data you talk about. You talk about those particularly the types of data in terms of violence um, uh, and and um, and progress and health. Um, I'm very taken by the by the work of the late Hans Rosling and the Gapminder uh, Institute. Um, uh, and the way that they too bring sort of a great sense of optimism to the world when when people working in public health and epidemiology may, may be saying we have you know all, all of these challenges. So I'm taken by that. Could you talk to us a little bit about about the types of data um, in the research that you've done over your career that have meant most to you beyond beyond the ones from those two books? Uh, well, I've um, I yeah you know, I I'm trained as an experimentalist, but it is frustrating to do your own experiments because you, you can only kind of dribble in a few uh, observations at a time, whereas the bigger the data, the uh, more solid your conclusions. So I've been, you know, I started out, I, I uh, would bring college students into the lab and offer them some, you know, beer money to sit through an experiment and they would see shapes and press buttons or see words or sentences. I'd bring kids in uh, or go to daycare centers with little duck and bunny puppets, and you know, and that, that was good. But um, we are coming to appreciate more and more that our intuitions about how many uh, subjects you need for a sound conclusion are, are likely to be faulty. We should have known this a long time ago because Amos Tversky published a brilliant paper in 1970 called "The Law of Small Numbers: Belief in the Law of Small Numbers." That was a kind of nerdy joke play on the law of large numbers, the law of small numbers being not a law of, of statistics, of course, but a law of psychology, which is that we humans tend to believe that a sample of any size is going to be representative of the population from which it's drawn. So we tend to underpower our studies. We tend to, uh, that's one of the reasons behind the, the notorious replicability failures. Um, the, uh, uh, and so I've been heartened, that, you know, growing up in the, in the tradition of running, running, you know, 10, 15, 20, you know, maybe 30 subjects, uh, the revolution that allows you to sample data sets that uh, are the fruits of many other people's research. Uh, in the case of child language acquisition, which one of, was the other of my uh, early interests in uh, psychology, in the mid-80s, in a kind of precocious um, big data moment, uh, a, a number of um, my fellow psycholinguists digitized transcripts of children in conversation with their parents, sampled, say, an hour a week uh, over several years, and, uh, and, and um, amassed. One of my graduate advisors led one of those studies in the 60s, but he, only, he studied three kids. Uh, he was ahead of his time. But his data, together with people from all over the world, got amalgamated into something called the Child Language Data Exchange System. And that, that revolutionized my life in the 19, back in the 1980s when instead of 25 kids playing with ducks and bunnies, I could have you know, tens of thousands of sentences. And I published a number of papers of uh, analyzing the, the, the uh, trends in uh, uh, children's speech. Even then, um, it was, I, you know, I was hungry for more, and I actually wrote a grant proposal for something that I, we whimsic whimsically called the Human Speech Home Project. <laughs> which is to try to get, instead of an hour a week, to try to get like everything that a small number of children said uh, and that their parents said to them, uh, that is at least an order of magnitude more data. The, it was turned down. I didn't get the money for it, and I, I did other things, but that, that was my, my dream at the time. So that was one area in which data uh, just kind of changed my life, although more would have been better still. Uh, also analyses, and this again was kind of precocious before the big data revolution of the 21st century. One of the first thing, sources of big data were uh, corpora of uh, uh, written language. Uh, there was something called the uh, Brown Corpus led by uh, Kutra Francis, a million words of English text. And I went back to that many times in looking at just the structure of the English language, the statistical structure, just to give you an example, just so we're not being totally abstract. I was interested in regularity and irregularity in linguistic phenomena. So we've got, you know, a, for the past tense in English, you've got walk walked and explained explained and uh, talk talked and 
Uh, uh, but we also have irregulars, break broke, run ran, come came, uh, which are, have to be memorized because they're idiosyncratic. Well, here's an interesting fact. If you look at a data set of the English language in order of frequency of words, how many times does a word occur uh, per million words of text, you find that the most frequent verbs in English are irregular. Uh, there are a minority of word types. There are only about 165 irregular verbs compared to about 4,000 verbs in all. But they are the top 10 in uh, English, and they probably make up a majority of the actual usages. That's an interesting fact, and I think the explanation is that Irregular forms like come, came, or go, went, uh, uh, sing, sang, they got to be memorized because there's no rule behind them. They're exceptions. Memory can only cope with things that are repeated often enough to uh, actually be consolidated in memory. And so there's a, constantly a Darwinian process in the language itself where words that are frequent enough can tolerate irregularity because people hear them often enough that they can memorize them. When a word declines in in, in frequency, uh, like chide, whose past tense used to be chid, then you got a generation of children who won't be exposed to he chid me often enough to, for it to stick in memory. It'll then default to the regular side and you get chided. So that's another example of a, a kind of epiphany that can, could come from looking at data on, uh, on language. But that's in my the phase of my life where I concentrated on language and visual cognition. And then as I came across data sets on war and, and, and democracy and hunger, there were a whole other set of epiphanies.